Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here for this sixth day of the Virtual Island Summit. It's been an amazing week. We've had a lot, um, a lot happening. Um, and I'm really interested and excited to be here for today's session. Just before we go into things, my name is James Ellsmore. I'm the CEO of Island Innovation. And as hopefully you know by now, Island Innovation is a global network of islands working on sustainable development. And we deliver events, projects, and services for a range of clients working in the sustainable development sector for the benefit of island communities. Um, today, we're moving to St. Helena. Uh, for those of you who've attended our previous events, you'll have seen St. Helena has been very involved. We had the Chief Minister speak at the Island Finance Forum earlier this year and have had um, various representatives join over the last few events. And today we'll be focusing on the idea of ecosystems, biodiversity and conservation. I think this is a super interesting project that we're looking into that relates um, both to uh, natural, natural environment, but also water resources for people living on the islands themselves. Um, before we go ahead, I just ask you to quickly fill out the poll that you should see on your screen, um, just so we know who you are, where you're joining from, um, or if you're watching on the live streams on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, you can go ahead and add a comment there. Feel free also to add a comment in the chat so we know where in the world you're joining us from. You can see someone is working with St. Helena. I see a lot of people joining from Europe, but a few from the Caribbean as well. Um, people from a range of different sectors, interesting, from across academia, NGO, government, and the private sector. And as we might have expected, uh, not a majority, but a significant number of people working in the environment services and ocean conservation sectors. I'll share those poll results for those of you in the Zoom chat already. Um, so with that, I would like to invite our two uh, speakers to turn on their cameras. Uh, we have uh, Shayla Ellick, the project coordinator for the RSPB, uh, joining from St. Helena, and she's joined by uh, Kirsten Ellis, also from the RSPB. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for being here with us. Um, we'll start off uh, by going uh, straight into the uh, film that you provided, and then we'll come back for some questions and a little bit of discussion afterwards. But before we go ahead, maybe Shayla, you can just say a few words um, about the film and about the project so people have some context to start off with. Brilliant. Thank you so much and thank you for having us. So the St. Lena Climate Forest Project is a multi-year collaborative um, project working to implement the Peaks Management Plan for the St. Helena Peaks National Park. So this area is a globally significant area. It holds about a sixth of the UK's endemic biodiversity, and it provides the majority of the island's fresh water. So very significant for the island's future. Um, we're currently in year two of the project. Over the previous year, we have been building our resource bank, which includes um, having some short films made just to cover the various areas of work of the project. So. Our aim is ultimately to create a documentary over the longer term to document progress of the project. Um, and then this film summarizes all of those areas of work and the project aims um, just for project promotion, really. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and play uh, the film, which is about uh, 15, 20 minutes long, and then we'll come back shortly for questions to discuss further. So you can go ahead and turn off your cameras and we'll be back soon. St Helena is a UK overseas territory that rises out of the South Atlantic 2,000 kilometres off the coast of West Africa. A unique and remarkable island, the central peaks on St Helena contain some of the few remaining fragments of cloud forest globally.
This unique habitat provides a home for species that don't exist anywhere else in the world, called endemics. There are daisies, which have evolved into large trees, blushing snails, and woodlice that glow under ultraviolet light. Cloud forests are found in tropical, mountainous regions, where the trees are constantly surrounded by fog. They cover less than 0.4% of the world's land area, but are home to an estimated 15% of all species. Over the last 40 years, cloud forests have decreased by almost 20%. St. Helena's cloud forest has declined from an estimated 600 hectares before humans' arrival on the island to just 16 hectares today. The area is protected within the Peaks National Park, but faces significant and ongoing threats from fast-growing invasive species and habitat fragmentation. The Peaks National Park is home to 250 unique species known as endemics, which are not found anywhere else in the whole world. This includes endemic plants and invertebrates, and represents one-sixth of the unique species the UK government is responsible for from all its overseas territories and within the UK. The cloud forest is also important, as it is the main water supply for the island. The island has already faced three severe droughts in the past decade, and climate change projections for St Helena predict a major increase in severe drought events. The St Helena Cloud Forest Project is a highly collaborative, multi-year project to implement the St Helena Peaks National Park Management Plan under three key work strands or pillars. The UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office the FCDO, has provided £1.9 million funding for the first two years of the project and provisionally agreed further funding for years three and four. On-island partners include the St Helena Government, or SHG, the St Helena National Trust and Connect St Helena. The RSPB, the UK's largest conservation charity, provides overall project management the Cloud Forest Project is building on 30 years of incredible conservation work on St Helena. Support for the project is provided by a range of international organisations and experts, but their role is to enable the amazing teams working on the island to scale up their work and develop their understanding of good conservation practice. The project aims to increase cloud forest habitat by 25%, and boost the water supply by a fifth. Under the biodiversity pillar, the Cloud Forest Project aims to significantly increase the scale of habitat restoration taking place in the Peaks National Park. This includes increasing the number of plants propagated in the two nurseries, as well as increasing the staff resource within the Peaks Conservation Teams. Within SHG, the Environmental Management Division, or EMD, leads on habitat restoration on the peaks. Habitat restoration starts with seed and seedling collection and plant propagation of species which are endemic and native to the cloud forest habitat. Seed and seedlings collected from as many remaining wild individuals within the same populations are used for propagation. Many of these have been planted in accessible and easy to maintain areas called living gene banks. These areas represent a living resource and supply of seed for new plants to be used in habitat restoration. The plants are propagated in the two nurseries, one at EMD, Scotland, and the other on the peaks. Some of the more difficult to grow species, like ferns, may be propagated in the new laboratory at Scotland, recently set up by EMD Scotland and the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Yeah, and then put the roots straight into the hole. Well, because this is dry and you could wet it, that's the other. The Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew have been supporting conservation work on St. Helena for many years. 
As part of this project, they are working with the team at EMD to provide horticultural advice and develop the seed bank for peak species and other St. Helena endemics. The project has also provided a new micro-propagation laboratory on island at the EMD nursery at Scotland. This world-class facility has been supported and set up by colleagues from Kew and training provided to EMD staff. The facility will greatly improve the capacity to propagate the harder to grow species and especially the many important fern species found on the peaks. Once they germinate, seedlings are grown on and cared for in the nursery until they are ready to plant out. Invasive clearance is necessary to provide space for these new plants to grow. After the initial clearing and planting, repeat visits to the site are needed to give the endemic plants a chance to establish and thrive. The peaks are home to invertebrate species not found anywhere else in the world. Part of the project is to identify these species and to gain a better understanding of their ecology so we can ensure the work being done is helping to protect them. The St Helena National Trust is leading on this aspect of the work and they do so by monitoring what is found on the peaks, where it lives and what plants they rely on. An invert specialist with the St Helena National Trust is now in place. This has been supported by the CEH, Howard Mendel, Roger Key and Vicky Wilkins of the Species Recovery Trust in the UK. A recent visit to the island helped with identification of invertebrate priorities and methodologies for sampling. Teams in the UK's Natural History Museum are also helping with DNA analysis of new and existing specimens to support identification of invertebrate species and to gain an understanding of population genetics. Visiting researchers are helping conservation workers to better understand the genetic diversity of species, as well as the impact of plant pathogens to help improve the way we undertake conservation. The UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, working with the University of British Columbia, have been supporting the conservation effort by increasing our understanding of the genetics of the important peaks species. Their work will inform conservation practice in the future. Connect St Helena lead on the water pillar aspects of the project to gain a better understanding of the water cycle on island and to ensure the future of the water supply. The principal source of the island's water supply is from mist and rainfall recharge in the peaks. Approximately 25% of the water used on St Helena comes direct from stream and spring flows intercepted in just two of the peak's catchment areas. Cloud Forest Project and Darwin Plus 103 data will be used to update our knowledge of water source and use over the next few years. While rainfall in the peaks is important, it is estimated that up to 60% of the fresh water on St Helena comes from mist capture and the endemic vegetation is far more effective at this than invasive species like flax. The water pillar work is match funded from a Darwin Plus project looking at climate change and drought resilience. Our aim is to link priorities for restoration of biodiversity with priorities for rain and mist capture to increase the island's water supply and improve resilience to climate change. Work to date has included establishing a better climate monitoring network through the establishment of additional weather monitoring stations on the island. Seven automatic weather stations have been purchased and set up across St Helena, including two located within the Peaks National Park. Data from these is transmitted to the station at Bottom Woods and from there to the Met Office in the UK. Information from these weather stations will improve day-to-day -day weather forecasting on the island and enable better, longer-term climate monitoring. Advice on the weather and climate monitoring aspects of the project is provided by Steve Palmer and the UK Met Office. Partners Arctium, directed by Ben Sansom, are working with Connect St Helena to lead the water pillar aspects of the project. Darwin Plus 103 and the Cloud Forest Project 
are also establishing a network of surface and groundwater monitoring sites. These locations help the project team understand how much mist and rainfall reaches the springs and streams, and how much reaches the island's aquifers. We are also looking at the difference in water captured from endemic vegetation and flax through canopy drip measurements. The majority of monitoring data is being collected by a Darwin Plus project water resource monitoring technician with the water resource team at Connect St Helena. Longer term, this climate, stream and groundwater monitoring data, along with geophysical survey work being done by partners, will provide a much better understanding of the hydrogeology of St Helena and enable us to show how effective the restoration of endemic habitat is at increasing water availability on the island. This pillar of the project aims to promote the peaks as a unique visitor attraction. The Peaks National Park occupies the highest ground on St Helena and is visible from and provides views over much of the island. Human history over five centuries has significantly altered the peaks. Evidence of astronomical, military, agricultural and plantation activities dominate. But there also remain small fragments where it is possible to appreciate the nature of St Helena before human discovery. As one of the few remaining cloud forest habitats globally, the peaks can provide a unique wilderness experience in the heart of the island for locals and visitors alike. The peaks is supporting business activities like tourism, forestry and farming that contribute to and benefit from the natural wealth of the national park. SHG are also leading on the socio-economic aspects of the project, which aims to develop the tourism potential for the site and engagement with the community. Year one of the project will establish an understanding of who is accessing the peaks and why. A visitor survey will be collecting baseline information to inform future development. We are establishing resource banks of images and stories about the peaks to enable us to communicate the special nature of the site. We will be developing a social media presence and a project page is being created on the St Helena Tourism website. Future work will also include a review of existing facilities and infrastructure to establish how we can improve the visitor experience in a sustainable and appropriate way. So here we've got flying. The Peaks offers a fantastic learning resource at all levels. Project work includes developing learning resources for schools. The education team and St Helena National Trust are currently producing an education pack for primary school children and a range of learning resources at secondary level. All up the stem. The St Helena Research Institute are involved in the project. Their focus is on identification of the research opportunities and priorities within the peaks and are supporting the development of a number of research bursaries. Visiting researchers provide an important source of income to the island and this is something St Helena is eager to continue to support and grow. Engaging with the local community is key. Community engagement events are planned as part of the project for example, public talks and presentations and activity days for youth groups. St Helena's ancient cloud forest is arguably the most important site for wildlife on British soil. The Cloud Forest Project aims to safeguard this unique and precious site for generations to come. That was a really fascinating insight into conservation practices on St. Helena. Um, I personally found the link to, as I mentioned before, 
both the value of the unique species that are found there, but also the importance for the water resources for people living on the island um, to be a really, really uh, interesting angle. Um, I'm looking forward now to having a bit of discussion about this. I could see some chat uh, comments coming up in the chat and feel free if you have questions to post them in the Q&A and we will, um, we will come to them. Uh, I guess just to start off with in terms of um, this project, for this type of conservation to happen in somewhere like St. Helena, which has the specific challenges of being remote, um, what are the what 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 is challenging about this project? What are the unique aspects of St. Helena um, that uh, had to be overcome that maybe would not be faced on um, the UK mainland, for example? Um, so I think so St. Helena is very isolated, as you said, so we're in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, we have logistics, I guess, is, is a big um, barrier. So when we're ordering equipment and um, are getting our researchers in, um, the equipment comes on a boat once a month. And if you don't order it um, in time, it could take months for, for specific pieces of equipment to come. And so recently we've opened up an airport. And so there's weekly flights, but obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, St. Helena was, um, kind of essentially in lockdown. So we had quarantine in place. And so researchers that came out had to quarantine for up to 10 days sometimes. Um, so it's just kind of, yeah, access to the island has always been an issue, but the projects kind of go on regardless. And I think um, we've made good progress over the previous year um, because of that. Anything you wanted to add to that, Kirsten? I was just going to say, I mean, I think um, the other thing is potentially being such a small island um, kind of capacity in terms of staffing and resource can, is always um, an issue that we that we have to we have to um, resolve. Um, potentially, you've got, um, you know, problems attracting people to the roles within conservation. But I have to say that on St Helena, you know, we've had a, a quite a long history of some fantastic conservation work. And um, there's been, you know, a lot of investment in building capacity on island and we've got a really fantastic team. And certainly year one of our project has really been focused on that, building the infrastructure in terms of the facilities that we need to really scale up this conservation work, but also to support um, the fantastic teams working on island um, to, to better understand the area, to improve their conservation practice through their own, you know, developing their own knowledge and bringing in those, those uh, international partners as well. So obviously this is a massively important site for biodiversity. We saw some of the uh, flagship, if that's the right word, species that are found um, there. Maybe we could just go into a little bit more about the specific, um, some of the endemic species that really um, stand out that are found in this uh, habitat. Sure, so um, I mean, I'm more of a plant person, so there we have beautiful um, cabbage trees, they're called, so they're basically uh, tree daisies, so they've evolved over many, many years and become these kind of beautiful spreading trees. Um, so we have the black cabbage tree and he cabbage, she cabbage. Um, there's also some beautiful ground cover in terms of ferns and things. And then there's about 250 plus invertebrate species, including um, a spiky yellow wood louse, which glows under UV light. And it's pretty amazing to see. Um, uh, many, many other kind of very charismatic little invertebrate species, including golden sp sail spider. We're doing some more research into the lichens and the bryophytes and other kind of um, assemblages in the um, in the ecosystem. But yeah, this kind of there's over 250 species that we could just talk about forever. And it's like well worth a visit to St. Helena if you ever want to kind of come and see the cloud forest in, in person. Fantastic. Are there any, this question just came in the chat, but um, the question specifically asked about balancing 
tourism with the risk of bringing in non-endemic species? I know that the tourism context is very specific on St. Helena. So maybe we can even divide that up into two questions. More generally, the risk of non-endemic species and what needs to be done to manage them and avoid new arrivals. Yes, so um, obviously since our um, since our discovery and kind of settlements of the island, there's been massive introductions of non-native invasive, invasive species, including goats and rodents and various plants um, over the years. And th these have all had a very detrimental impact on our um, biodiversity. Um, so our focus has always been on kind of reducing risks from inv invasive species. We're also with this project specifically focuses on biosecurity. So um, encouraging people to please stay on the paths to make sure boots and clothes are clean. So we're not um, kind of risking uh, introducing new species or pathogens or anything like that into um, our climate forest habitat. Um, so yeah. The, the New Zealand flax, which you saw featured in the video, is um, was the industry was introduced in the late 1800s and kind of took off in the early 1900s. Um, and there are kind of records of endemic trees being cut down for, to make way for this this industry. And you'll see that there's kind of um, all of the uh, hills of the of the Central Peaks are kind of covered now with the with the New Zealand flax. And it's very hard to guide because it's on steep cliffs. It's very difficult to access. So invasive species is a massive focus of our project, but sometimes trying to access those areas safely and, and, and um, remove it and then having enough of the species to the endemic species to put back in um, is part of what this project is, is working on. So we're upscaling our plant production, endemic plant production, so that we can um, re restore our endemic habitat um, as much as we can. Thanks, Shayla. And then the other part of the question had asked about tourism. And I know that uh, there's a lot to say about tourism in St. Helena. So maybe uh, you could just kind of, for people that don't have that context, give a bit of a high level overview of what the tourism situation now, especially given that the island only fairly recently opened up to visitors um, coming in. Just, just people may not even know about the airport and that whole, the whole history there. Yeah, so I'm oh, sorry, Kathy, you go ahead. <laughs> sorry, so yeah, so the, um, the St. Helena has, for most of um, our access, has been only available to, to the public by, by ship. So in 2017, I believe, um, the airport opened um, and we were, we were accessible by air and a bit more frequently. So the ship would come in once a month. At the moment, we have supplies by ship, but um, the now people access, passenger access is by air. Um, so tourism was kind of picking up before the COVID-19, 2019 pandemic. Um, and obviously with us being closed for about two years, um, there was very limited tourism to the island. So we opened up again early August and we have seen um, obviously, it will take a while for tourism levels to get back to pre-pandemic um, levels, which I believe was about 2,000 a year, but I have to check those figures. Um, but we've seen steadily over the, over the course of the last two months, maybe, like the flights have been full. We're seeing people who've been wanting to come out for years now kind of definitely getting on the um, planes and coming, which is great to see. And we're also seeing people who haven't been home for a number of years to like return into the island. So there's um, a big market in um, returning saints coming back home and seeing the island after a number of years. There are a number of the population living in the UK and other countries. Um, so that's also really great to see. Oh, sorry, Kirsten, I thought you were going to add something. I, I can do. I mean, in terms of what the project's doing, if it would be helpful to add kind of, um, you, you mentioned at the, at the beginning that balance of um, ensuring that the the uh, we don't introduce more um, kind of issues to the to the cloud forest through tourism. Um, 
but it, it's an important economic, um, you know, economic part of the feature for the island. So what we're we're trying to do is to is to encourage tourism in a sustainable way. So working with St Helena government and the tourism um, team there, looking at working with local tour operators so that they understand the special nature of the site, so that we're using things like sticking to the paths. We're making people aware of our of our biosecurity policies um, on on the actual site itself, um, and just and just thinking about how we can kind of um, share the message about how important the site is and how people can conserve the site, but also enjoy it because at the end of the day, it is one of the the last remaining areas where people can see cloud forest. Absolutely. So I presume the site itself is a is part of the draw to the island as a as an attraction. And as you say, it's getting that balance between the obvious economic needs the, and the economic benefits that tourism provides, but also that prevention. Now, very interesting. Um, Stacy Alvarez had asked in the chat about the education factor. So specifically, um, education of young islanders in local local schools is there anything you can add about um how um islanders but specifically young islanders are being brought into this project and how the community is being engaged and education resources are being provided <laughs> sorry, I'll take this one. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yes. Yeah, so, as part of the project, um, the the, uh, the the Saint Helena National Trust are kind of leading on the education side of things, but we're working with um, the Saint Helena Government Education Department. And Saint Helena National Trust have provided resources around kind of conservation and um, encouraging young people on islands to, uh, to to understand their kind of natural heritage before. But what we've done as part of this program in the first year is to develop some resources resources specifically focused on the cloud forest. Um, so we've been putting that education pack together. There have been a number of um, students that have come out to the to the cloud forest in that first year. Um, but the, the intention is that, that that pack can be used in all of the primary schools on island. Um, but also what we will try and do as part of the project is facilitate visits. But again, there's that balance about where those visits go and ensuring that uh, that we're not kind of, you know, um, impacting on um, the kind of uh, the the completely wild and pristine areas of, of cloud forest. Um, so it's about sharing the messages with young people again about how special it is, but that they should, you know, you can't love something if you don't know it. So we need to get people out to, to, to see it and, and understand it and enjoy it. Um, this year is focused on primary, but we are also looking at secondary resources as well. And, and certainly some of the, uh, some of the um, visits that have happened in in the last year have included um, some A level students coming out to do projects. And again, it's just about encouraging people to use that as a learning resource, um, whilst also appreciating and sharing the messages about how special it is and how to protect it. Absolutely. So, so the water resources question, if we can just come to that um, part of the motivation here. Uh, well, one of the many motivations is to ensure the sustainability of water resources for islanders. Um, how important is the cloud forest for ensuring there is enough fresh water for people living in St. Helena? The cloud forest is massively important. Um, it, it's the majority of fresh water comes through um, the cloud forest. Um, I think the estimate is that 40% comes from just two catchments and there are a number of catchments around the area um, and that actually up to 60% of the water that um, is used on the island is through mist capture rather than rainfall. So these clouds being surrounded, these um, these peaks being surrounded by clouds, they're actually, the, the, the vegetation is actually capturing the mist drop, the water droplets from the mist. And that's an incredibly important source of water um, for the island. What we what we have kind of discovered on previous projects is that the, the native vegetation is much better at that mist capture. It also promotes soils um, that are much more more peaty and hold that water for longer. So then you know that that water supply is more sustainable. And so what we're we're aiming to do is to increase the um, the area of uh, native and endemic vegetation that's available for, for mist capture. So while we have priorities around biodiversity, we also have priorities around water. So we're balancing where we're restoring based on where the, the, the kind of best water capture um, sites are, but also connecting up fragments of cloud forest for biodiversity. 
Um, it's early days, I have to say, um, and obviously we're, we're in the, the process of setting our baseline as well. So we're trying to understand exactly where the water um, goes when it when it falls, either as rain or is captured as mist on the peaks, where it goes to, how it recharges aquifers, how it how it um, flows down through the stream. So how best we can utilize that. But our ultimate aim is that by um, increasing the cloud forest cover over the next five to 10 years, we can actually in increase the water supply by about a fifth. And, and someone did actually mention in the chat the idea of, of an alternative water resource being uh, desalinization, uh, getting water from the sea. So I, I wanted to point out that although the technology there is viable, the cost of doing that and the amount of fuel needed to do that is really, really prohibitive for an island like St. Helena. So although you have places like Dubai that rely on a lot of, of um, fresh water coming from the sea, the cloud forest system is far more natural, far more efficient, and probably much more cheap, I would imagine, than trying to de take water from there. There was a really interesting comment from Janet Lawrence from Connect St. Helena um, that added, and I, I just wanted to highlight this, the, the population distribution on the island is not centered around one or two specific centers, that the population is quite distributed across the whole island. And then, so um, I hope I'm getting your point across Okay, Janet, but was the idea that um, distributing the water to so many remote farmsteads in different valleys and different parts of the island presents a challenge. And I think that's also worth noting specifically how that impacts that. Um, and just well, thank you, Connect St. Helena, for being so in involved in these events. I think it's great to see you here, Janet. Um, anything else to add on, on that point around water resources? No, I can see I'm just trying to look at different comments coming in through the chat. So um, you have a number of different partners involved. Maybe we can just have a quick comment about the coalition of organizations that came together, because I think part of the ethos of, of the summit is the importance of bringing government NGOs and civil society, the private sector and academia all together for these projects. And it looks like you almost have all of those uh, sectors represented. And in most island contexts, it's necessary to have all those uh, different partners involved. So any comments about the coalition of organizations involved in the project? So, I mean, it's an incredibly strong partnership. You saw from the film that the three key partners on, on island are St. Helena government, um, Connect St. Helena, uh, which Janet Janet's from and has, and has commented on, um, and um, the St. Helena National Trust. So you've got the key major players on the island that, that, that are involved in the water, uh, biodiversity, and obviously um, local government. And, and really it started, this the, the Project in the cloud forest has been has been going on for a number of years, but on a, on a fairly small scale. So this this um, project to really ramp it up started in about 2018, where St Helena government brought all those key players together. And I think that was the the really important thing is bringing all the partners and stakeholders together right from the start. So those three key partners on island, but also um, international support through through RSPB to support the kind of the management and the process, and um, and you know key research institutions like um, and, and uh, knowledge based institutions like Q, um, the, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology um, and Arctum, who are who are kind of key to the water element. So bringing all of those together um, has really made this partnership really strong. As you say, it covers all the people that need to be involved. And because they've been involved from the development, they've had an input into the peaks management plan and to the implementation plan. You know, it, it, it just adds to that strength. Um, and everybody's bringing kind of their their strengths, but also um, their outcomes and their goals are included in that in that process, which is which is why everybody kind of is there at the table working together on this. And with um, the ac academic research specifically, often a problem for islands and very unique species or unique ecosystems is a lack of information because they're harder to study. Um, I'm wondering now with the island having increased accessibility because of the airport and now um, with obviously the, the COVID pandemic, we hope being uh, over and, and the ease of people coming to the island, that's now able to change. Um, what is the research situation like currently for um, 
academics looking to study um, the, the unique uh, wildlife and the unique ecosystems on St. Helena? So um, I think St. Helena has a strong relationship with a number of institutions and a number of researchers. And so there has been some quite good study in the past, but I don't think there's any doubt that we still lack the knowledge that we need to fully understand the cloud forest, to fully understand the interactions there, um, and to inform our conservation practices moving forward. One really positive step in development recently is the St Helena Research Institute, and that's really about trying to coordinate and bring together that research build links with additional academic institutions. Um, and so that work is also kind of underway and, and partly for the cloud forest supported by this project, but it's obviously much wider than that because it covers the kind of the whole of St Helena as well. So through the through the cloud forest project, the research institute again are a partner, so they will be working to, looking to, um, to, to reach out to different organizations. We have some studentships funded um, through the Cloud Forest Project. So we're looking to develop relationships with academic institutions to recruit students to those, to those programs and to really focus on what we feel are the priorities for research so that whilst it's, it's offering a fantastic opportunity for research, it's getting the answers to the questions that we need to inform conservation practice moving forward as well. Absolutely. And I'd just like to mention as well, Island Innovation, uh, we have an academic council to connect to island based research centers and institutions. Um, and the goal of our organization is to share um, share academic research and opportunities between island settings um, to ensure that there is an opportunity to disseminate research, which may be in an academic format to be used by policymakers. So um, just to mention that we are, that's a program that we're running and uh, hopefully that we'll be able to work with the St. Helena Research Institute, who are also our partner last year for our event as well, which has been um, great and really uh, the work that Rebecca and Tara and the others involved in that doing is, is really fantastic. I'm hoping that we have Shayla back. Yes, she's back again. I think you're having a bit of an internet issue there. Um, yeah. I think we can wrap up now. I'm not sure if there's any kind of final remarks or comments that um, either of you would like to leave us with um, about the project before we, we finish. I, th I think just to say, I mean, it is an amazing project to be involved with. It's, it, it's really fantastic. The scale on which we're hoping to work um, I think is 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 kind of really ground really groundbreaking. Um, and I've noticed there are a few kind of questions in the chat and in the and in the Q and A. If 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 we can answer those after our, by kind of typing in, I'm, I'm more than happy to try and do that. Or if anybody wants mine or Shayla's email to try and answer any other questions, then obviously we're very very happy to do so. Um, we're happy to connect you as well. If anyone, uh, I tried to get to most of the questions, but if you want to connect to Kirsten and Shayla, just send our team an email and we'll be able to connect you as well. Um, fantastic. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kirsten and Shayla, for taking the time on a Saturday to be with us and share some information about this project. Really looking forward to following um, how uh, how things move now and, and see the, the momentum um, that, to continue over the next few years. Um, I wanted to mention to everyone joining that in about three hours, we have a, another session uh, on uh, the energy transition and specifically financing the energy transition for islands. Um, that session will be in French, but with interpretation into English. So you'll be able to listen to it in English. Um, and we'll be joined from a number of our, our team members and colleagues in Guadeloupe who will be leading that conversation. Um, thank you again to both of you um, and for the, the excellent film. It was really, really interesting. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.